Uh, it's a very uh, distinct uh, honor and pleasure to be with you here at uh, St. John's, a place that I've um, known and admired from afar for many years. A uh, particular pleasure to be here with uh, old friends and students from, uh, from Yale, Sean Colberg and Kristen Bradman, who have been wonderful hosts to me. Thank you both. Um, and uh, it's great to be here with, uh, I'm sorry to say, someone who's not here tonight, Michael Patella, one of the members of the congregation with whom I serve on a um, committee to um, update the NAB New Testament translation. So stay tuned on that one. Um, Michael was off at an ordination, so he has a good excuse for not being here. Uh, when Sean invited me for tonight's lecture, he indicated that uh, these 50th anniversary uh, years of the Second Vatican Council served as a framework for lecturers to talk about uh, the significance of that watershed in the uh, history of the church and its role in promoting ecumenism. I'll do so this evening, both as a scholar and as uh, someone shaped in significant ways by the spirit of Vatican II. And let me begin on that personal side. My study of scripture has uh, developed in a context and among a fellowship of uh, scholars, many of them members of the Catholic Biblical Association, who have been uh, formed and shaped uh, by the vision sketched by the Council of Fathers in their document Dei Verbum. We've also worked very much in the spirit of a subsequent document, the Pontifical Biblical Commission's paper, The Interpretation of the Bible and the Church, which was created in 1993. I'll come back to both of those texts before the end of the evening. Uh, but first, let's remember where we, or some of us, were 50 years ago. And for those of you for whom that's ancient history, enjoy it for a minute. <laughs> In 1962, as the council was getting underway, I was a student at Boston College High School, a Jesuit uh, prep school serving the Catholic population in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I was a conventionally devout young man, well accustomed as we all were in those days to the Latin Mass, and not particularly familiar with the Bible, beyond what we heard in the cycle of liturgical readings. I was, however, always enamored of the cadences of what we knew as the last gospel. Remember those days when um, the opening of the Gospel of John was read at the end of Mass? The last gospel. Uh, some of you, no doubt, remember those cadences, and you probably recite them here on a regular basis. We recited them in uh, English today at um, the Noonday Service. In Principio erat verbum, in verbum erat habedeum, in deus erat verbum, etc. Uh, that sort of thing rang in the back of my head for many years and in fact prompted me to go where I finally went into the study of scripture and uh, particularly the study of the fourth gospel where I spend most of my time these days. Uh, within a couple of years of 1962, things changed rather dramatically. We, and I used, uh, used that word deliberately to include the laity, we were praying the mass in English a result of Vatican II's dogmatic constitution, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, which I think you've already heard about in the series. We were also engaging the world in new ways in the light of faith, encouraged not only by the urgency of contemporary events, but by the spirit of the Council's constitution, Gaudium et Spes, joy and hope. For me, as a student in secondary school, and then after 1963 at Boston College, that engagement meant taking seriously the struggle for civil rights by African Americans and wrestling with the morality of our war in Vietnam. Uh, le plus ça change, le plus ça même chose. The vocation of the priesthood beckoned, but I finally decided I did not have the charism of celibacy. But theology continued to intrigue me, and I was particularly interested in what was going on in the study of scripture. Even undergraduates, had some sense of the enthusiastic engagement with that study that was taking hold in Catholic circles at the time. As a classics major, I had been studying some of the requisite languages, so decided to pursue the study of scripture professionally. What drove that desire and that professional goal uh, was, um, uh, what was it that, that drove it uh, among young Catholics at the time? The Concilia document Dei Verbum was at least part of the picture if only the tip of the iceberg. That document highlighted the importance of scripture for the life of the church and enshrined as the official position in the church a stance of openness to critical inquiry. Both moves 
enormously encouraging to anyone who wanted to study scripture coming from an intellectual background. Let's think then about Dei Verbum. One of the four dogmatic constitutions or major documents of Vatican II, it was solemnly promulgated on November 18, 1965 by Pope Paul VI. The opening paragraph of Dei Verbum, which we also heard today at the Noontime Liturgy, is a marvelous statement about what the reading of scripture should be and what it should do in and for the church. Uh, it's well worth repeating. It says, hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, the sacred synod takes its directions from these words of St. John. We announce to you the eternal life which dwelt with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard we announce to you so that you may have fellowship with us and our common fellowship be with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, continues Dei Verbum, following in the footsteps of the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council, this present council wishes to set forth authentic doctrine on divine revelation and how it is handed on, so that by hearing the message of salvation, the whole world may believe and by believing, it may hope, and by hoping, it may love. What a marvelous paragraph. It's a fine example of what church historian John O'Malley, uh, author of a major history of Vatican II, calls the panegyric style of the documents of Vatican II. That style, unlike the legalese of most documents of earlier councils, is designed to illuminate and to inspire in this time of challenge for the church, confronted by secularization and atheism without, and occasional bits of sin within, those inspiring works of Dei Verbum are worth keeping in mind. But our subject is the Council. What the Council did in Dei Verbum, and what we are called to do in reading and interpreting script, sacred scripture, is to proclaim the message of salvation, so that the world may believe, and by believing it may hope, and by hoping it may love. The elder whose epistle Dei Verbum quotes would be quite pleased by the use of his text uh, in that formulation of the council. And I also think that that is a message very much in line with the lived example of our current pontiff, Pope Francis. <coughs> Beyond the inspiring preface, it's also worthwhile to recall what the rest of Dei Verbum sets forth as we explore further its significance for ecumenism. So let me give you a little sketch of Dei Verbum if you haven't read it lately. Chapter 1 <coughs> offers a theology of revelation, stating God revealed God's self and God's salvific will for humankind, first in creation, then in the history of the people of Israel, and finally and definitively in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. <coughs> it's interesting to note how Dei Verbum relies on scripture to make these points. The first chapter of St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans grounds the claim that we can know God through the works of creation. Paul's perspective opens the way for a natural theology and thereby for exploration of the way in which God is known to men and women of other religious traditions. Implicit, that is, in the very structure of that first paragraph is a very broad ecumenism. In fact, not simply ecumenism, but an openness to interfaith dialogue. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Dei Verbum also uses the Gospel according to John as a framework for understanding the significance of Christ. St. Paul's remarks in Romans and 2 Corinthians on the obedience of faith offer a foundation for Dei Verbum's sketch of the theology of salvation and grace. Scripture, then, is very much a part of the fundamental doctrine of revelation that Dei Verbum develops. Documents from Rome often seem to cite scripture as a convenient proof text. Dei Verbum does much better than that, as it describes what revelation is about. And that is not accidental, as we'll see. Chapter 2 of Dei Verbum treats, again, in a very succinct form, theological issues that divided the Christian world since the time of the Reformation. In a remarkably ironic fashion, this conciliar document affirms the importance of sacred tradition alongside scripture, 
not as scripture's master, but as its faithful expression. We take this so much for granted these days. It's a major change. Tradition is linked to the teaching authority of those who stand in the succession of the apostles who, in the words of the text, guard the word of God scrupulously and explain it faithfully. Good traditional Catholic notes. Yet tradition is not static. It develops organically. Interwoven with these, with these affirmations that echo the Council of Trent is also the shade of John Henry Cardinal Newman as at 2.8, which states, this tradition, which comes from the apostles, develops, <coughs> tradition develops, those very words encapsulate Newman, develops in the church with the help of the Holy Spirit. For there is a growth in the understanding of the realities and the words which have been handed down. This happens through the contemplation and study made by believers who treasure these things in their hearts. Dei Verba here nicely alludes to Luke chapter 2, verses 19 and 51. It continues, this uh, growth and understanding happens through a penetrating understanding of the spiritual realities which they, believers, experience, and through the preaching of those who have received, through Episcopal succession, the sure gift of truth. Both what the faithful experience and what the Episcopacy preaches are essential parts of what keeps the tradition moving and developing. An extraordinary uh, affirmation on the part of this document. Yes, says Dei Verba, tradition is important. And yes, as Newman insisted, traditional teaching does develop. However, that development is to be understood. As many commentators have pointed out, this is a very carefully nuanced formulation affirming a principle of biblical hermeneutics that has played an important part in the, in the church since the Council of Trent. Yet the affirmation of that principle, the importance of tradition, limits the role of tradition and firmly anchors it in scripture. Tradition is not a source of revelation independent of scripture, not a separate vehicle for truth, but the ongoing expression of the meaning of the revelation recorded in scripture. How then does that process of ongoing interpretation work? Chapter three, building on the notion of revelation, presents a doctrine of inspiration and begins to consider what is involved in the process of interpretation. Dei Verbum affirms that the Holy Spirit inspired sacred authors who, and I quote, consign to writing everything and only those things which he, the Holy Spirit, wanted. From that premise, flows an inference. Again, I quote, it follows that the books of scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation, end quote. Here, once again, a balancing act is underway. The position of Dei Verbum at this point, if it stopped there, and that position, which echoes some of the language of the Pontifical Biblical Commission at the time of the modernist controversy at the beginning of the 20th century, would be welcome to some of our separated Catholic brethren, who might bristle at the notion of an authoritative tradition, but who place a very high value on the inerrant written word of God. But if the document had stopped there, it would have been an obstacle rather than a stimulus for Catholic biblical scholarship. Furthermore, insofar as Dei Verbum has implications for ecumenism, it had it stopped there, would have directed Catholic efforts primarily to the evangelical end of the Protestant spectrum. But, there's always the but, the document did not stop with the affirmation of scripture as a text that teaches revelation faithfully and without error. Whenever you see a conciliar document such as Dei Verbum taking a strong and identifiable stance, wait a minute. <laughs> Article 13 continues. However, since God speaks in sacred scripture through men, and all right, we should use inclusive language, through human beings in human fashion, the interpreter of sacred scripture, in order to see clearly what God <laughs> wanted to communicate to us, should carefully investigate what meaning the sacred writers really intended and what God wanted manifest by their words. 
The next two paragraphs, continuing the balancing act begun here. The first encourages interpreters to pay attention to the literary forms with which scriptural authors work. In order to get the message of any ancient text, and I quote here again, Dei Verbum, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic styles of feeling, speaking, and narrating, which prevailed at the time of the sacred writer. This is uh, section 3, uh, 12. Here, Dei Verbum echoes, and a footnote makes this clear. It echoes the encyclical of Pope Pius XII, Divino Afflante Spiritu, written in 1943. That document, in fact, is the Magna Carta of Catholic critical biblical scholarship. And it opened the doors for Catholic exegetes to engage in such critical scholarship, what the later pontifical document will call scientific scholarship. Dei Verbum does not inventory what such scientific scholarship contains, but it insists that an ancient text must be recognized as such, an ancient text produced by human beings and interpreted in the light of the conventions of the time of its composition. It recommends, that is, the fundamental move of historical critical study. The balance to this position in the next paragraph, which, beginning with another but, asserts the importance of reading any particular part of scripture within the context of the whole of scripture. Thus, however much do we attend to the literary forms and original contexts, what some scholars insist on as a canonical reading is necessary. And that, once again, is subject to the judgment of the church. These are useful and important caveats, and we'll have to come back to them. But note the balancing act in this text. Extraordinary, the way in which it touches various positions and brings them together. Chapters 4 and 5 offer brief characterizations of the Old and New Testaments, stressing that the former prepares the way for the latter. And the latter, particularly the Gospels, uh, contains valid historical recollections of what Jesus really did and taught. The wording of um, the, the section of Dei Verbum on that last point, chapter 5, article 19, was a major bone of contention in the development of the document. Much of the controversy of the anti-modernist period of the first part of the 20th century had to do with issues of historicity, or to be more precise, with a kind of bi biblical literalism or even fundamentalism. As recently as 1961, the Holy Office had issued a monitum or warning about opinions of scholars that had challenged the historicity of biblical documents. Indeed, the Holy Office tried in 1961 to remove two Jesuits, Stanislaus Lyonnais and Maximilian Zerwick, from the faculty of the Pontifical Biblical Institute for their views on issues of historicity. I can assure you, neither of them were modernists in any sense whatsoever. But that's ancient history. To return to Dei Verbum, the final wording of the article that we've just read that strikes this kind of position uh, offers something of a compromise on the issue of historicity. It says, Holy Mother Church has firmly and with a absolute consistency held and continues to hold that the four Gospels just named and we all know what they are, whose historical character the church unhesitatingly asserts, faithfully hand on what Jesus Christ, while living among men, finally did and taught for their eternal salvation until the day he was taken up into heaven. What the text calls the historical character in Latin, historicitatem, is not, nor can it be, straight and simple facticity. In the debate about the document, other more explicit and rigid formulas were proposed. And on September 22, 1965, a few weeks before the final vote on this text, the Council Fathers voted on the wording I have just cited, with 2,162 in favor, 61 opposed, and 10 valets void. As historian of the Council Francis Holland notes, this chapter does not affirm a crass historicism. The historical reliability of the Gospels is affirmed precisely in the context of those insights gained from modern biblical scholarship. This is, end of his quote, this is clear from the way the document goes on to describe the process of the composition of the Gospels. Again, note the balancing act. The document says, Dei Verbum says, the sacred authors wrote the four Gospels, 
selecting some things from the many which had been handed on by word of mouth or in writing, reducing some of them to a synthesis, explaining some things in view of the situation of their churches, and preserving the form of proclamation, but always in such a fashion that they told us the honest truth about Jesus. That last uh, translation uh, translates the Latin vera et sincera de Jesu, uh, true and real things about Jesus. So not the truth about Jesus. Okay. Um, the final chapter of Dei Verbum, chapter 6, offers some general practical advice about, for instance, the utility of ecumenical translations and the importance of the study of Scripture, quote, under the watchful care of the teaching office of the Church. Thus far, Dei Verbum. Before thinking further about its effects and the effect of the balancing act that it uh, creates or engages in, it might be worthwhile to pause and reflect on the process by which it came to be, because I think that is instructive for what finally gets into the text. It was always clear that the production of this text was not a simple and straightforward one, but instead one that took many years and the work of many hands. Students of the Council have now given us very good accounts of that process. The story begins before the opening of the Council. The first draft of a conciliar statement on Revelation was sent, along with the drafts of six other texts, to participating bishops several months before the council began on October, uh, October 11th, to be precise, of 1962. So these were coming through during the summer of 1962. The draft on Revelation had emerged from an initial document proposed by the Theological Commission headed by Cardinal Ottaviani. Some of you are probably familiar with that name and the role that he played in the council. The initial draft, prepared in 1961 by a Jesuit, uh, Father Sebastian Tromp, was entitled De Deposito Fidei Pure Custodiendo, or on how you keep the deposit of faith pure. The title suggests the document's defensive stance. By the time it was sent out to bishops, it had been given a new title, De Fontibus Revelationis, on the sources of revelation. Bishops were supposed to send back responses, evaluating this document by September 15th of 1962. Many did, and we'll have more to say about that momentarily. The draft document, De Fontibus, was submitted to the Fathers of the Council on November, uh, in November, and on November 21st, 1962, the draft was decisively rejected, with 1,368 bishops voting against it. Council historian John O'Malley called the vote a turning point in the development of the council. So Dei Verbum is very important, not only for what it teaches, but for the process by which it was constructed, which in many ways um, undergirded and supported uh, the role of, uh, of um, many of the bishops on uh, on the John the 23rd side of the council, who really wanted to engage the modern world in a significant way. Um, so what happened uh, when De Fontibus Revelationis, the document on revelation and scriptural uh, interpretation, was rejected? Well, all of you who are involved in um, academic life or uh, monastic life, and you know what the standard uh, procedure is, you appoint a committee. <laughs> and that's precisely what uh, John the 23rd did including on it some of the pariti, or non-voting experts, who were in attendance at the council. One paritas appointed to the committee was Joseph Ratzinger, who played a major role in the developing story. The committee did its work of redrafting and revising, and three years later, November 18, 1965, the final text of Dei Verbum was approved. For those who were counting votes, 2,350 council fathers voted in favor, six were opposed. What happened between the first and last votes on the document was a long and laborious process involving the participation of several leading theologians in collaboration with fathers of the council. Of the many who had a hand in Dei Verbum, three stand out. Their role is well documented, by their own writing and by such historians of the Council as Father Jared Wicks, a Jesuit whose accounts in uh, the journal Theological Studies offer an excellent treatment 
of the development of this document. One of the three Pariti was Joseph Ratzinger, who prior to the council was on the theological faculty at uh, the University of Münster and served as theological advisor to Cardinal Frings of Cologne. When the cardinal received the request for input on the initial draft in the summer of 1962, he shared it immediately with Father, Father Ratzinger, who wrote a response in which he criticized the document for its style and its substance. It was not the pastoral document that the council was called upon to produce. Its theology, to him, sounded dated, reflecting the long tradition of scholasticism that he and other theologians of the day wanted to reform. It was also not particularly conducive to ecumenical outreach on scriptural matters, a passion of Father Ratzinger, who was especially interested in dialogue with the Lutheran Church in his native Germany. Cardinal Frings accepted Ratzinger's evaluation, basically signed off on it and sent it to Rome. The Cardinal followed up by inviting Father Ratzinger to give a lecture to a group of influential Cardinals in Rome in October 1962, spelling out his criticisms in greater detail. Among those present was a fellow named Giovanni Cardinal Montini, who, as you know, later became Paul VI. The lecture reinforced the sense of many fathers that the schema was inadequate. Father Ratzinger also recommended that the document be introduced with a statement about revelation, as it now is, reflecting the developments in Catholic theology during the previous 50 years. He then collaborated with another well-known German theologian by the name of Karl Rahner to produce a draft of their own statement, which was circulated to Council Fathers. While Ratzinger was advising his cardinal on the topic, another Jesuit, Peter Mulders of the Netherlands, was advising his ordinary, Archbishop Giuseppe Beltrami of The Hague, in a similar way. Father Mulders was subsequently appointed to be peritus to the bishops of Indonesia and advised them along the same lines as he had Archbishop Beltrami. Mulders criticized the draft document, De Deposito, for missing essential elements of the emerging doctrine of revelation. Note how important the doctrine of revelation is in this whole thing. In the old scholastic fashion, a doctrine of revelation focused on the propositional content of revelation, not on the revel revelatory act of God's self-disclosure. Mulders, like Rahner, was eventually appointed to the commission charged to redraft the document on revelation that became Dei Verbum. The third major contributor to the process was Jean Danielou, a well-known French theologian and patristic scholar. He came onto the scene through the Archbishop of Toulouse, uh, Gabriel Garon, who agreed that the draft document needed more on Revelation, and Danielou drafted a version for him focusing on Revelation as self-disclosure. That theme runs through all of this, and you can see where it's coming from, the Catholic theologians of the Ressourcement period. Uh, the period prior to the Second uh, World War. Um, Father Ratzinger was particularly well equipped for his role in the development of Dei Verbum. As a young German academic, he had written a second dissertation, a habilitation schrift, uh, which one has to do if you want to become a serious German professor. You have, can't get by with just one dissertation, you've got to do two. And um, Ratzinger's focused on St. Bonaventure and his understanding of Revelation, which Ratzinger read as an alternative to the prevailing Thomistic theological formulations. Revelation, he argued, is always more than its formulation in Scripture. Scripture gives a fixed and normative witness, but this remains the material principle of Revelation, which is, itself exists as a vital lived reality in living subjects. Think about Dei Verbum and the way in which it insists upon the ongoing experience of those who are reading and understanding scripture. Ratzinger was there. This important insight, to which he calls attention in his memoirs, published in 1998, lurks behind many of the formulations of Dei Verbum. Ratzinger's uh, suggestions about revelation, by the way, did not convince at least one of the readers of his dissertation, who didn't want to see it published. And it wasn't, in fact, pub the, the Habilitation Schrift was not published until 2010. By then, it was clear 
uh, that Joseph Ratzinger was no heretic. <laughs> In any case, the work of the Pariti and the bishops finally came to a successful conclusion and Dei Verbum was promulgated. What did the sacred constitution achieve? We can point to three major conceptual breakthroughs and two practical consequences. First, as the brief history of its composition suggested, Dei Verbum articulated a new and compelling, I think, way of thinking about revelation, not as the publication of a set of dogmatic propositions, but as a dynamic process of the dis disclosure of the reality of God, inviting humanity into an ongoing and deepening relationship with God. The Council Fathers did not invent this doctrine, but the fact that they endorsed it was significant. Second, the Fathers of the Council also endorsed, at however abstract a level, critical biblical scholarship. Not without some caveats, as we've noted, but endorse it they did nonetheless, rejecting alternatives that have, could have turned the clock back in the world of Catholic biblical scholarship. This again was not totally new. Pius XII and Divino Afflante Spiritu had anticipated the Council Fathers, but they endorsed the impulse of that encyclical and in the process shifted the attitude of the hierarchy toward biblical scholarship. Third, Dei Verbum's irenic tone on issues that had long divided Catholics and Protestants signaled that biblical interpretation should be ecumenically engaged, something very much on the mind of um, then Father Ratzinger when he issued his critique of the first draft of the document. On the practical level, Dei Verbum opened the Bible to the church and encouraged all the faithful to read it. Then Cardinal Ratzinger, in commenting on the documents of Vatican II, celebrated this phenomenon in his remarks on the final paragraph in uh, uh, some years after the uh, council emerged or ended. And he said, it seems to me incontestable that with this statement uh, of the council, the church has more or less renounced the monopoly of alone being able to read and be in charge of the Bible. In this simple way, it provided the yardstick for the renewal that it introduced in the incredibly short span of three years. It's worth repeating. It seems to me incontestable, said Ratzinger, that with this statement of the Council, the Church has more or less renounced the monopoly of the alone being able to read and be in charge of the Bible. Despite all of the things that it says about the supervision of the interpretation of the Bible by the hierarchy, etc. Secondly, at the practical level, the endorsement of critical scholarship encouraged people to be scholars. Although Catholic scripture scholars with the encouragement of Pius XII's encyclical had worked diligently in the decades prior to the Council, a new wave of young scholars emerged in the 60s and 70s. The ecumenical outreach fostered by Vatican II had a part to play in this development. In my own case, Again, to get personal, the decision to engage in the study of scripture after reading classics in Cambridge brought me to the New World's Cambridge and to Harvard University, a bastion of serious scholarship, but also a very liberal Protestantism. Harvard's Divinity School, despite its Calvinist roots, had become Unitarian in the early 19th century. In Harvard's doctoral program, there were Protestants of every stripe, from conservative to quite liberal, and a strong contingent of young Catholics, some in religious orders, particularly Jesuits, and some, like myself, lay men and women fascinated by scripture. Similar things were going on at other old centers of Protestant scriptural learning in the U.S., like Yale, where I now teach. Similarly, the University of Chicago Divinity School, a Baptist foundation, has as its current dean a learned Catholic exegete, Margaret Mitchell, and Union Theological Seminary in New York, a liberal Protestant institution, had on its faculty for several decades the renowned Catholic biblical scholar and Sulpician father, Raymond Brown. Catholic institutions in America, such as the University of Notre Dame, CUA, Catholic University, and eventually Georgetown, BC, and Fordham would later catch up, but usually by hiring Catholic graduates of the more established, originally Protestant universities. Ecumenical biblical scholarship fostered by Dei Verbum flourished. Catholic biblical scholarship in organizations such as the Catholic Biblical Association of America continues to be pursued in an ecumenical context. Such engagement will, I fervently hope, continue to be a hallmark of the discipline 
in the 21st century. An example of that ecumenism is the fact that Protestant scholars serve on the panels that are involved in the, um, uh, the renovation of the NAB translation. Besides ecumenical engagement, what else should characterize Catholic biblical scholarship moving forward? Before giving some suggestions, it's useful to recall the second document that I mentioned at the start of tonight's lecture. That second document is important since Dei Verbum, for all of its significance as a watershed in the life of the Catholic uh, Church and of Catholic biblical scholarship, is important primarily for its doctrine of revelation and its affirmation of the possibility of critical scholarship. It endorses, as we have seen, a critical approach, but does not say much about what such a critical approach would involve. The second document, which does precisely that, was presented by the Pontifical Biblical Commission in um, 1993 and published in 1994. It's entitled, The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. Composed about a quarter of the a quarter of century after Dei Verbum by the 19 scholars who were members of the commission, the interpretation of the Bible provided a comprehensive review of the hermeneutical issues involved in scriptural study. Endorsed in a preface by then Cardinal Ratzinger, this document remains a valuable introduction to the field of biblical interpretation. It details the various kinds of questions that traditional historical criticism asks, such as, what was the original text of the Bible? What do its words mean? What literary form does a text have? How was it shaped in the process of editing or redaction? What historical situation did it address? Uh, the Commission's document goes on to review the many kinds of questions that scholars have posed in more recent scholarly developments, questions that address the narrative and rhetorical dynamics of biblical works, questions about the sociological and anthropological frameworks presumed in a text. The Commission's document also notes the kinds of questions raised by scholars with definite and admitted points of view, questions about how texts relate to struggles for political liberation, gender equality, etc. These are areas of inquiry that have generated the most controversy in recent decades. The remarkable document of the Pontifical Biblical Commission finds something to affirm in virtually all of these sets of questions or methods of analysis. It shares the irenic and uh, capacious view of scholarship and theology that we get in Dei Verbum. It suggests that all of these methods can help shed light on sacred texts. At the same time, it insists that virtually all of them, like the basic historical critical method itself, have a potential downside, which usually consists of a tendency to reduce the significance of a text or ignore its truly religious claims. We are familiar with that critique of historical criticism, which by situating a text in its ancient context can lose sight of its possible existential, real significance for a contemporary audience particularly one concerned with issues of faith. Analogous criticism can easily be raised about any method for biblical study whatsoever, any systematic or scientific approach, as the uh, Pontifical Biblical Commission calls them, through its focus or through its presuppositions can both illuminate the object of inquiry and blind the inquirer to the reality for which the approach is not adapted. By their very questions, liberationist and feminist critics have opened our eyes to the realities of our texts, their relationship to structures of power, their gaps and their omissions. But there are other questions that can be asked, other perspectives that can illuminate. The general principle is that you go hunting with a trap made for rabbits. It is rabbits that you will probably catch, not crocodiles or elk. An interpreter of the Bible needs to be equipped with many approaches to the task of interpretation, and that is what the Pontifical Biblical Commission affirms. So what of our future as interpreters of Scripture? If Catholic biblical scholarship does nothing more than live by the recommendations of these two important documents, Dei Verbum and on the interpretation of Scripture, it will continue to make enormous contributions to the life of the Church. It will do so reading the sacred text critically, but in a balanced way that takes account of the church's long history, as well as the contemporary realities that we confront. 
To reinforce that point, it might be useful to highlight just a few of the things that critical scholarship has taught us during these last 50 years. First, critical biblical scholarship has given us a new appreci appreciation of the person of Jesus and the ways in which his teaching engaged and inspired his followers. It has reminded us that Jesus was very much a Jew. Although as Father John Meyer in his magisterial multi-volume work on the historical Jesus reminds us, he was a marginal Jew. Jesus was faithful to the ideals of his people, but like many prophets before him, was not afraid to criticize his contemporaries, including people in positions of power and responsibility who often collaborated with larger political and economic forces. He was not afraid to be provocative, to lay down challenges to men and women who were attracted to his vision of the reign of God. <coughs> Identifying those challenges generally does not require uh, extreme sophistication. We know what turning the other cheek means. We know what giving all to the poor means. Even if we take these expressions to be hyperboles, living by some version of these provocative challenges remains the real challenge for most of us. We know that peacemakers are blessed, that the poor, or according to Matthew, the poor in spirit, are blessed. But living by an ideal of poverty and being a peacemaker is never easy. Some of Jesus' challenges are less transparent. What do we make of the remark that there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God? Critical scholarship has helped us understand more about the reign or kingdom of God that Jesus preached. That realm is indeed a hoped-for, promised reality, but it could be tasted in the here and now, in the work of Jesus of healing, in the finger of God that cast out demons. That realm could also be grasped in the vivid images of the stories that Jesus told, stories that still have the power to engage the imagination, to challenge and to inspire. Critical scholarship has taught us that those stories, Jesus' parables, are far from simple illustrations of sermons, but are means of forcing hearers to question basic assumptions. Think about some of those parables. The Good Samaritan tells a story of compassion, but it also challenges the hearer to put two words together that would not sit well on the tongue of a first century Jew, good and Samaritan. While it pokes fun, of the pretensions of the moral pillars of the day, the priests and the Levites. An exercise I often use with students is to concoct a contemporary version of the parable. Who would fit into the role of a Samaritan? A businessman, a bureaucrat, a politician, a refugee, or even a terrorist? And who would fit the role of the priest and the Levite? I'll leave you to decide. Well, consider the prodigal son, another story, particularly as Luke presents it, of compassion and forgiveness, modeled by the father who slays the fatted calf for a son who is dead but has now come back to life. But the story is one that also serves as a reminder of the way that compassion and mercy, on which Jesus asks his disciples to follow him, has its price. For in gaining the son who was lost, the merciful father, it seems, at the end of the story, seems to be in danger of losing the elder son. The father is not simply a cipher for God. He could be us, and he reminds us that mercy can divide as well as unite. If we've heard the voice of Jesus more clearly through the efforts of critical scholarship, we've also come to appreciate more deeply the environment in which he conducted his ministry, especially Galilee. Uh, and we've learned this especially through the efforts of uh, scholars such as Sean Frain, uh, the late uh, Irish uh, historian of Galilee. Galilee, with its complex mix of highly observant Jews, exploited peasants, and ambitious local aristocrats, sounds an awful lot like our own environment, uh, trying to bring the, era, the area into the modern, then modern world, that area, Galilee, was a region that felt cleanly the globalizing forces of its day. Tracing Jesus' reaction to those forces remains a complex task and one that's fraught with implications for the contemporary engagement of the church in the political sphere. 
Jesus was clearly not a revolutionary or a terrorist, like the Zealots who, a few decades later, would lead Israel into open revolt against Rome. His was an ethic of nonviolence, of turning the other cheek and forgiving abundantly. Yet while he allowed rendering to Caesar what was Caesar's, he insisted on rendering to God what is God's. That seemed, above all, to preserve a space for the sacred, for the kingdom of justice and compassion that is not of this world. His action against the money changers of the Temple of Jerusalem, which probably led to his arrest and execution, was symbolic of that commitment. We could go on all evening, working through the issues associated with the historical Jesus, but you get the idea. Attending, in all of the complexity of what attending means, to what Jesus said and did in the context of the first century is not simply an academic exercise. It can be and has been in the preaching and teaching of our Catholic community a way to foster belief and by believing, hope, and by hoping, love, the program the Dei Verbum called for. Critical scholarship has, of course, done much more. In addition to its concern with the originating moment of the church's life on earth, it has attended to the specific ways that the, the significance of that moment was understood by the evangelists, by Paul, and by other writers of the New Testament. We saw how Dei Verbum specifically singled out that process and hinted at the complex set of questions that could be posed, questions that the Biblical Commission in interpreting the Bible described more fully. Most courses on the New Testament at Catholic Faculties of, of Theology will help students understand how Matthew shapes his story of Jesus as a kind of new Torah for an emerging church. How Mark tells his story of a mysteriously challenging Jesus, the Son of Man, who accepts the cross and calls on his followers to accept theirs. How Luke shapes the, his biography of Jesus, the compassionate champion of the poor, and then, in good historical style, tells a tale of the early church, challenged from without and subject to dis discord from within, yet somehow guided by the Spirit. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And what of the fourth gospel? The course will probably not have enough time to do justice to it, this story in which babes can swim and elephants can drown. A critical appropriation of John will note how much this evangelist has contributed from his own resources uh, into his very dramatic portrait of Jesus. How in his hands the mysterious Jesus of Mark becomes the complex sacrament of the presence of God, both now and into the distant future. How his message is given a laser-like focus on a single principle. And how that principle challenges everyone to respond to God by serving one another. Yes, interpreting the Gospels and their messages historically, critically, scientifically, as the Pontifical Biblical Commission insists, will confront you with an invitation to believe, to hope, and to love. All of this engagement with the text of Scripture may, as Dei Verbum hoped, serve a salvific purpose. But it may also, from time to time, raise a difficulty. And lest I paint too rosy a picture, it might be worth reflecting on at least uh, one or two of those difficulties before concluding. I return to Dei Verbum and the tense of principles it articulates. Its doctrine of inspiration affirms that Scripture teaches solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into sacred writings. Dei Verbum also affirms that human authors played a role in their selection and interpretation of what to record. Where humans are involved, there is the likelihood that something will go awry. In the case of the fourth gospel, we have one of those matters where the message got a little mixed. I refer to the way in which the character of the Jews is portrayed. All the gospels, to varying degrees, describe the opposition that Jesus faced from elements of his own people, often identified as the religious elite, the high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. Some of those elites appear in the pages of the fourth evangelist as well, but they all seem to be submerged under the category of the Jews. Even if we try to take the sting out of that portrait by translating uh, the phrase as the Judeans, we cannot ignore what seems to be the evangelist's suggestion 
that the opposition that Jesus faced is somehow connected with the opposition that the evangelist's own community faced. And we're then confronted with the harsh polemic in chapter 8, where Jesus calls this opposition, the Judeans or Jews, children of the devil, a murderer from all eternity. As good historical critics, we may do well to situate this text in its first century context, to note the harsh criticism traditional prophets leveled against their contemporaries, or the bitterness of inner Jewish polemic of the period, evident, for instance, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We may thus relativize the Johannine depiction of the Jews and keep it penned up in antiquity. But then we're confronted with the way in which this text and its depiction of the Jews has been used in the negative history of Jewish-Christian relations up to and including the horrors of the Holocaust. If we are good, critical, or as the Biblical Commission calls us, scientific interpreters of scripture, we cannot ignore these facts. Facts, as I like to tell my students, are sacred things. Their lives should never be sacrificed on the altar of a general idea. But what are we supposed to do with these facts? Interestingly enough, Vatican II offers a suggestion, not in Dei Verbum, but in another of its most important texts, the Declaration Nostra Aetate, in our time, which clearly and definitively repudiated anti-Semitism and whatever theological basis it may once have enjoyed. We can learn something important from this text and from some sub subsequent history. The Pontifical Biblical Commission is not quick these days, as it was a century ago, to issue directives. Since the one in 1993 that I've already discussed, it has issued only two more in the last 20 years, one on the Bible and morality in 2011, and one on the Jewish people and their sacred scriptures in 2001. The latter document deals with the fourth gospel's treatment of the Jews and suitably relativizes its negative overtones. The critique of the Jews must be, this Pontifical Commission's document says, must be read in context, historical, literary, and canonical. For John's gospel, after all, salvation is from the Jews. And as Paul expressed it in Romans 11, God's salvific plan involves the proposition that all Israel will be saved. What's instructive about this issue and the way in which it's handled in this uh, text of the Pontifical Biblical Commission, um, more than a half century after the Holocaust and more than 30 years after Nostra Aetate, uh, is the way in which it illustrates a process of continuing reflection, precisely the kind of thing that Dei Verbum calls for. There are problematic passages in scripture and they can be used to negative purposes. The devil, as we know, can quote, quote scripture to his own ends. Biblical scholars and church leaders both learned, however slowly, from the experience of history that this had to be dealt with and dealt with directly. The negative passages about the Jews in John are not the only ones that can cause heartache and pain. Others too, the Deuteropauline passages on the subordination of women, the very rare passages on same-sex relations, and perhaps others will no doubt come to mind. As we move into the 21st century, reading our scriptures, reflecting on them, and trying to live lives of faith, hope, and love based on and inspired by them, will no doubt confront us with some of these passages more than once. We may well go through a process similar to that evident in Vatican II's Nostra Aetate and the Biblical Commission's 2001 document on Jews in Christian scripture we will bring to our text the perspective of experience, and importantly, the insight of interpreters of scripture from other faith traditions. As Joseph Ratzinger argued against the neo-scholasticism of his day, we will also find revelation unfolding in the hearts of the faithful responding to God's grace. And in doing so, we'll continue both the letter and the spirit of Vatican II. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Attridge. Um, we have time for just a few questions. I'll try to moderate that. We don't have microphones for that, so if you could yell, uh, that would be good. So, and then I'll try to wrap things up. So. Mm -hmm. question and uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, answer it totally to your satisfaction in a very short time but let me um, try and let me try in the following way uh, first of all uh, think about one of the other principles that um, the uh, council articulated in its balancing attempt to say that there is uh, definitive and reliable revelation here in this text and that mm, uh, insight into what the revelation uh, is all about grows and develops with the experience of the community of faith, et cetera, okay? And that any particular text needs to be read not only critically, but also in the context of scripture as a whole. Um, the texts that you've cited in the Old Testament are uh, one part, uh, one set of witnesses to the way in which the God of the Old Testament was uh, understood and affirmed by the people of Israel in antiquity. Um, but that understanding was criticized within the pages of the Old Testament itself. One of the things that I used to insist on when I was teaching um, uh, Scripture back at, and teaching the whole of it, now I teach the New Testament, I don't uh, do the, the Old Testament very much, but back at Notre Dame when, um, uh, when our colleagues here were in classes uh, under me, um, I delighted in having people read precisely some of those texts that you have just read and just alluded to, and talk about what, what, it was that the, what it was that the God of Israel is, if those texts are correct, and then to read something like Job or Kohelet, and to see what Job and Kohelet is saying about those texts. And what Job and Kohelet is saying about those texts is that those texts are wrong, that the understanding of God that they represent is not the God of Israel. So you have within the pages of the Bible itself a critical dialogue about how the people of Israel have come to understand God working in their history. Um, that's not something I think you, you teach kindergartners, but it's certainly something that, um, that anybody who's growing and uh, developing a uh, mature and sophisticated understanding of what the faith tradition is needs to know and needs to recognize. And it, it also undercuts any simplistic understanding uh, 
of uh, some of the affirmations that are made here in this text, as Dave Urban itself undercuts the simplistic understanding of what, uh, what those affirmations are. Again, a concilia document is not a, um, a systematic or critical theological text. It is a statement of these, what, uh, 2,200 bishops coming at things with varying degrees of theological sophistication and varying kinds of interests and concerned to affirm certain things that the tradition has taught. But they're doing so quite clearly in dialogue with contemporary theologians, people like Ratzinger, Rahner, and others, and with a goal in mind that this text that they're producing cannot be a simple reaffirmation of, uh, of unthinking principles about how to interpret scripture. It has to be something that's open, affirming, and balanced. And I think that's what they achieve. And one of the things that they achieve in this text is to enshrine certain kinds of principles that do indeed, when applied, lead to, I think, a, a, an appropriate and sophisticated reading of our biblical materials. So uh, no, I don't think any of the people who put this text, Dei Verbum, together, would want to affirm that the image of uh, the God of Psalm 137, who asked that babies' heads be smashed on stone, is a, uh, a true and faithful revelation of who God is. I think they would take into account the fact that other voices in ancient Israel critique that understanding of God and say, we have to take that into account. Does that help? It does. Yeah. Okay. Well, for most of my career, apart from uh, 12 years at the University of Notre Dame, I've taught in a, an ecumenical, largely Protestant environment, and most of my um, close colleagues are Protestants, so um, it, what, what I expect from them uh, is um, to listen to what I have to say, and uh, they, they, they expect the same thing from me. And so, uh, you know, what I expect is, is a cordial, critical um, dialogue about uh, issues. And, you know, most of the people that I deal with most of the time uh, come out on pretty much the same point uh, about most of the issues that we deal with th that I do. Um, you know, I, it, despite that I, the fact that I'm a Catholic, I don't think that the, uh, the scene where Peter is given the keys of the kingdom of heaven in the Gospel of Matthew is the installation of the first pope. Um, neither do most of my Protestant uh, colleagues. Uh, I do think it's a recognition of some sort of authority principle, and some of them might resist that a little bit, but, you know, there's a room for disagreement and room for dialogue there. Um, so uh, it, there are different people coming at, uh, at biblical texts uh, from different denominational, different uh, faith perspectives, and they bring something to the conversation when they do. Um, uh, my Lutheran uh, friends uh, have a very high respect for uh, Paul and his doctrine of justification by faith, however they understand it. And we often have dialogue about uh, how that is to be understood and how it's, uh, what the faith of Jesus Christ is. Is it something that Jesus exemplifies or of which he's simply the object or is it some combination? That's a debate that we can have whether we're Catholic or Protestant. Okay. Um, some of my Lutheran friends will insist that the epistle of James is a right story epistle, and uh, I have to insist that, um, no, it has something to say to us. So, yeah, but yeah, it's a friendly dialogue. Yeah. Uh, Bill Fisher? Or? Okay, um, Go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, actually, Professor Houston's um, intervention, I have a, a kind of two-faced question now. I wonder if in response to the first question, you would agree that um, when Dei Verbum says without error, it is, it, it is affirming of scripture that it teaches without error those things necessary for salvation. Correct. So as I think that your lecture made clear, it's not saying without error with respect to history, no. it's not saying without error with respect to ethics. Correct. Um, and uh, that leads me on to the second it, it, yeah, let me just re reaffirm that, because remember that the fundamental premise of the whole thing is what is it that's revealed, and it's God's self. 
right? It's not a set of propositions, either doctrinal or ethical or whatever. And it's a, a revelation of the person that invites a relationship. That is what is, is revealed fully, truthfully, etc. Yeah. And it's that which is for salvation, right. not history, mm -hmm. ethics. Um, the other thing, then, is that um, since the Second Vatican Council, and indeed since 1943, since Pius XII, since Hippocles got the modern biblical study started in the Catholic Church, there have been, on occasion, and you alluded to some of these at the end of your lecture, um, some pretty significant tensions between, let's say, the scholarly community interpreting scripture and the magisterium, which in the Verbum says that ultimately the magisterium will decide the proper interpretation of the text. What does one do, and do you think that the Verbum itself provides some sort of um, uh, a way to negotiate mm -hmm. that, those tensions? Yeah. Well, I think it does, and that's what I was trying to point to in my last, um, uh, la the last part of this paper, uh, that is that they, uh, the principle that uh, Ratzinger himself articulates and points to in some of his um, uh, reflections on the significance of Dei Verbum, about the experience of the, um, the, the community of faith uh, that undergirds any development in the understanding of scripture is not something that's unique to the uh, episcopacy. Okay? Uh, in Dei Verbum itself, you have this balancing act. The episcopacy has oversight, but it's informed by the growing understanding of the believing community as it engages in the life of uh, relationship with the God who's revealed. So uh, is that a simple answer to the question? No, <laughs> of course not. Is life simple? No, of course not. And so, uh, but I think in affirming the tension, Dei Verbum does something very creative and very positive. Another balance that you mentioned is uh, there in paragraph 12 of the Verbum that refers to, um, well, trying to balance, on the one hand, uh, a historical critical approach that focuses upon uh, the original author's intention, and, a, um, and on the other hand, an attention to the unity of scripture, uh, what has since become known as uh, a canonical approach. Um, and of course, the, that 1993 document also highlights the canonical approach in addition to liberation and feminist uh, criticism and all of that. I'm wondering, uh, 50 years after Dave Verbum, uh, 21, 22 years since the, uh, the commission's document, what's the state of that balance uh, with understanding you know, the unity of scripture, understanding the New Testament light of the old and the old and light of the new, and balancing that with historical is it a balance now, or is it a tension? Mm. What's the state of that? Um, I come from an institution um, which was the home of uh, a famous Old Testament scholar, um, Brevard Childs, uh, who mm, for many, many years uh, articulated a very strong notion of canonical reading of scripture. And in his case, it was focused, I think, primarily on the relationship between old and new. Uh, but that's not the only way in which a canonical reading of scripture works. Uh, I think what you have to do, uh, the, the, the fundamental principle here is you have to take into account for purposes of, of the, theology or ethics, not a single voice of scripture, but the whole chorus of scriptural voices that we hear. So in, as we were talking about before, we were talking really about understanding who God is. And hearing one of the voices in scripture that says who God is, is not going to be an adequate uh, source of theology. You have to take the whole into account. You have to take a whole into account if you're trying to understand what Paul is about. Because what he says on um, the law, let's say, in Romans is rather in tension with what he says in Galatians. Is there some underlying principle that unites those two? It's a question worth asking. Uh, you have to take into account pl places where there are severe tensions uh, between, let's say, Paul and James. Uh, is justification by faith something that one can affirm in a way that uh, would satisfy James? I don't know, it's a question worth asking. So the, uh, the principle that uh, the whole of scripture needs to be taken into account is a recognition of the fact that we have a complex set of voices with a complex set of principles being articulated in this process of revealing who God is. Okay? 
And uh, we have to recognize the integrity of each of those voices. The prophets are not necessarily speaking about the events of the life of Jesus when they articulate their uh, notions of uh, the suffering servant, etc. And to read that simply uh, in the way in which, let's say, Matthew read it is not adequate. It's not giving us the full range of voices that we hear. So, yes, I think most people will want in some way or other to recognize that for theological or ethical purposes, it's quite important to do a canonical reading as a whole, but that doesn't solve the problem for you. It gives you more data. <laughs> One more. I think we should give some recognition to those who the generation before you, you and, and so many of of us who are benefiting from the Durban because they suffered. I mean, people were silenced. Uh, Ray Brown, I went to a, a talk he gave, uh, this explaining Gary, Gary Durban back in the 70s. He was heckled throughout by uh, Catholics United for the Faith. Uh, people. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, gave us a great legacy. I have the highest respect for Ray Brown, one of my heroes. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor Attridge, and especially uh, a big round of thanks for Sean Kohlberg, who has pretty much given us 50 emails in the last 50 days about this. Thank you. And without further ado, a safe drive home. Thank you all for coming. A splendid evening. Um, I think you will all agree. <laughs> <laughs>